Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Good? It's Monday, it's raining. We will persist. Okay, so last time we were talking about um, absolute value equations, and we're still talking about those. So specifically last time we ended with something like 4x minus 3 in an inside of absolute value is equal to 9. And I raise the question of, well, suppose that, uh, so I'm covering up whatever's inside of the absolute value. What could possibly, what could I possibly reveal so that the resulting equation would be true? A nine, what, or a negative nine? Right. So, if if I were to reveal a nine, the equation would be true. If I were to reveal a negative nine, the equation would be true. And there's nothing else that could be revealed that would make this true. Okay. So what we're saying is that whatever is in there, whatever is in there, it's got to be a negative nine or a positive nine. Nothing else would suffice. So, that means that this equation splits into two possibilities. One of the possibilities is that 4x minus 3 is negative 9, or 4x minus 3 is positive 9. And so now here's two different equations, each of which can be solved independently, and they're both pretty straightforward. So, as for this one, you should add 3 to both sides. So 4x is negative 6, and then divide by 4. x is negative 6 over 4. As for this one, add 3 to both sides. So 4x is 12, divide by 4, so x is 3. So to understand, uh, the meaning of this, let's do a quick check. Right? What we're saying is that if we were to plug in negative 6 fourths, it should work. So 4 multiplied by negative 6 over 4, and then subtract 3, absolute value all of that, equal 9. Well, what is 4 times negative 6 over 4? negative 6, so that would be absolute negative 6 minus 3. And then negative 6 minus 3, well that's that's negative 9. And the absolute value of that <coughs> is 9. And then the other one's even more straightforward. What if you what if you replace that x with a 3? Then 4 times 3 is 12, minus 3 is 9, absolute value of which is 9. Okay. So how do we feel about this? This is okay? Okay. Further, I could ask, well, what about the absolute value <coughs> of 2x minus 9 equal to 0? And again, I'll raise the question. So I'm going to cover this up. And I'm going to say... What could I possibly reveal so that this equation would be true? Zero. Zero is the only thing that could possibly make this true. I, when, I, when I remove my finger, there's got to be a zero there, otherwise it's false. If there was a seven there, it could not be true. If there was a negative four there, it could not be true. Only if there is a zero. So unlike this one, where we said there's two possibilities. I could be covering up a 9 or a negative 9. Here, this one, there's only one possibility. I must be covering up a 0. Which is to say that there's just one possibility. The 2x minus 9 is 0. And so now here's a simpler equation, an equation that does not have absolute value. And you solve it in the usual way. So 2x 
is 9. So x is 4 and a half. Any question about this one? This one is OK. OK. <clears throat> then how about absolute value of 3x minus uh, 8 is equal to negative 4. Now what? So again, the question is addressed in exactly the same way. What could I possibly reveal <coughs> that could make this equation true? Nothing. There isn't anything that I could reveal that would make this true. Because whatever comes out of the absolute value has to be non-negative. It has to be zero or positive. So if you put a negative thing into the absolute value, a positive thing will come out. So it couldn't possibly be negative 4. If you put a positive thing in, a positive thing would come out. Similarly, not negative 4. And if you put 0 in, a 0 would come out. So there's nothing. So for this one, the answer is that there is no solution. So on one like this, there's two possibilities. On one like that, there's one possibility. And on one like this, no possibilities. OK, so now let's see why, an, a, a, a compelling reason why this should be the case. So last time, we talked about the shape of the plot of absolute value of x. So in, in plain language, could someone remind us of the shape of the plot of absolute value? A v, right? It's shaped like a v. With its point, the pointy part is at the origin. So I'm going to draw absolute value. That's more or less what absolute value looks like. And I'm going to draw a horizontal line, for example, like this one. So that horizontal line, uh, what does the equation of a horizontal line look like? Y is a constant. So this, is, this green that I drew here is y equal to a constant value. Uh, and because it's above the origin, we know something about that constant value. What? Must be positive. So this might be something like, say, y is equal to 3, maybe. So now I have a question for you about this picture. Would you please count for me? the number of intersections. Which is to say, would you please tell me, tell me how many times do red and green cross? <coughs> Twice, right? Once here, once there. They touch twice. And if I could draw just perfect, it would be symmetric, <laughs> right? So now I have a question for you. That is an xy coordinate right there. But if I drop this down to right here and just get its x-coordinate right there, what is the x-coordinate right there? It's got to be 3. It's got to be 3. <coughs> Because that's where 
y is 3 and absolute value of x is 3. Okay, that being the case, or that being observed, how about this x value? What's that one? Negative 3. Interesting. So, now, an algebraic example of doing this is something like 2x minus 7 is equal to 8. And I could ask, what could I possibly be covering up that could make this equation true? Negative 8 or positive 8. So you're telling me that there's two possibilities. So in principle, you could solve this, but right now I just want you to observe that the number of solutions is 2. And I'd like also for you to observe that in this picture, the number of intersections is 2. <clears throat> so now I want you to imagine the following scenario, that I could take this picture and that the green part was movable. So I could, I could grab the green part and I could wiggle it around. And you'd see the little threes wigg wiggling around as I wiggle them. Right? So as long as I keep the green thing up here, there's always going to be the two intersections. But if I grab it and I pull it down to the origin, then these two separate solutions will converge to a single solution. Right? Which is to say that I grab this pull this down to the origin, how many times will the green line intersect? Once, Once at the pointy place. Okay, so let's draw that. And then I'm, I want to draw the green right on top of the graphite, but if I do that, you won't be able to see it. So I'm going to draw the green just barely above the graphite. And you need to understand that they're on top of each other. So now, I'll ask the same question. I'm going to ask, please tell me about the number of intersections for red and green. How many? One. And it occurs right there. And x is zero. <clears throat> and then, three x plus two and absolute value is equal to zero. And I could ask, what could I possibly be covering up that when revealed would make this equation true? Zero. And there's nothing else that could possibly make it true. So as for this equation, the number of solutions is one. And then finally, I'd like for you to imagine that we began with this one and I noticed, I noted that if I wiggle it around and leave it up here, there's going to be two solutions. And then if I grab it and pull it down to the x-axis, there'll be just one solution. And now if I continue that and grab it and pull it all the way below the origin, what will occur? There'll be, there'll be no intersections in the picture and no solutions in the algebra.
So again, each one of these horizontal lines is y is equal to some value. What, what could be an example of this particular y value? Negative 3? It's got to be negative because it's below the origin, right? So I've said the question out loud a couple of times, and by now it might be becoming a little bit forced and obvious, but just to ask it again, how many times do the red and the green intersect? Zero times. And for example, on this equation, 4x minus 7 and absolute value equal to negative 3. What could I possibly reveal to make that equation true? Nothing. Nothing. So the purpose of this page is to show you the correspondence between the algebra and the geometry. More typically speaking, humans are very well equipped to understand this picture, right? If I hold the V fixed <laughs> and grab the green line, then up here they touch twice and then once and then and then not at all. Algebraically, such equations have two solutions in the end because there's going to be two intersections. Such equations like this have one solution because they're touching at the at the pointy place, the cusp. Cusp is the mathematician's name, but pointy place is good enough, I think. And then these don't touch. There's no solutions to this algebraically because these are not touching. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay. So now, if you'll recall, what we did last time is we were starting to solve quadratic equations. And then I gave you a quadratic equation. Um, and we noted, ah, we, we don't know how to factor this one. So we, we don't know how to solve it. Because the only quadratic equations that we could solve last time were ones that, where we could factor the quadratic. So we're building up a few more tools, and then we're going to start solving. So now, in order to get there, I need to remind you of something that you probably learned incorrectly in grade school. Would you please remind me, what is the square root of x squared? It is not x. <laughs> this, this is the most common incorrect answer that students provide. So this is not the answer. What's the answer? Absolute value. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Because I want you to consider this process. So let's take 5 <coughs> and then let's square it. What do you get when you do that? 25. And then now let's compute square root. What is the square root of 25? 5. So that's good. We started with the 5. We ended with a 5. So that's the way you expect it to work in a sense. But now let's take a negative 6. And let's square it. Well, what is negative 6 squared? 36. And then let's compute the square root of it. What is it? 6. Can someone say the problem? <laughs> right. So, so this, we put in a 5, and a 5 came back out. That's good. For this one, we put in a negative 6, and a positive 6 came out. So that is to say, that's the reason why this is absolute value. Okay, what comes out is non-negative. Okay, now I'm going to give you an exercise, and it's going to seem quite similar to the exercises on the previous page. And I hope that you have a strong sense of deja vu. So 3x minus 1, square this, is equal to 49. 
Now, I'm going to cover this up. I'm going to ask, what could I possibly be covering up that could make this right? A seven or a negative seven. <laughs> See? So I hope you're getting a strong sense of analogy to the previous one. So we could split it right here, which is to say whatever I'm covering up, whatever it is I'm covering up, it's got to be negative seven or positive seven. And I was covering up 3x minus 1. So it must be the case that 3x minus 1 is negative 7 or 3x minus 1 is 7. So this one equation split into two pieces. And then now each of these pieces can be solved in the usual way. So add 1, so 3x is negative 6, so x is negative 2, and then for this one, 3x is 8, so x is 8 thirds. So two possibilities. So for example, on this one, if we plug in negative 2, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, minus 1 is negative 7, square that is 49. Similar things for 8 thirds. Okay. Alternatively, alternatively, if, if this is a little bit disturbing to you to split the equation right there into two pieces, we can do some intermediate algebra with radicals. So I'll say or, so this is an entirely separate way to understand this exercise. You could say, okay, I'll compute the square root of both sides. So I computed square root of both sides. Square root of 49 is 7. I'll leave the left-hand side alone for one step. And now I'm going to ask, what is the square root of 3x minus 1 all squared? Absolute value. And then we can look at this equation and say, well, what could I possibly be covering up <laughs> that could make this equation true? A 7 or a negative 7. Because remember, the, 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 the top three rules about teaching are, the first rule is that you have to repeat yourself. The, the second rule is that you have to repeat yourself. Right? <laughs> Etc. Right. So, do you see the very strong analogy? I think. So, you either split the equation here, or you split it there. And if you if it's more comfortable for you to split here by going through radicals, that's fine. But you have to remember that when you do that, the absolute value shows up, and that's why that's why they both split. So one way or the other. <clears throat> Any question about this one? Okay, now let's do another one that is just like it. However, there's a minor difference and it is disturbing to many students. Um, 2x minus 7 squared is equal to 10. Okay, so now I'm going to ask exactly the same question. I'm covering something up. What could I possibly reveal? that could make this equation true.
I just want the exact answer. What could I possibly reveal? Square root of 10. What else? So when I ask this one, it's easier. So how about this one up here again? What could I possibly reveal to make this one true? A 7 or a negative 7. What could I possibly reveal to make this one true? Right, square root of 10 or negative square root of 10. So now I'm going to say the, the, the only sticking point that you're having, if you're having a sticking point, is that you know that 49 happens to have an integer square root. And honestly, there's, there's nothing whatsoever special about that. But I admit completely that human beings have a love affair with such square roots. Okay? We're just, just totally enamored with numbers that have integer square roots. And we all know, oh, 49 is one of them. <laughs> That's a good one. And we also know that 10 isn't one of them. Now, that, uh, that might be disturbing to you, but I'm telling you it makes no difference whatsoever. Okay, as far as this, as far as this exercise is concerned. So now, to say this again, I'll say it differently. What could I possibly reveal to make this true? Well, either the square root of 49 or negative square root of 49. And it just so happens that the square root of 49 is 7. For this one, what could I possibly reveal to make this true? Square root of 10 or negative square root of 10. Okay. So, let's do it. So what we're saying is that 2x minus 7 could be negative square root of 10 or... <coughs> 2x minus 7 is the square root of 10. And then 2x is 7 minus the square root of 10. So x is 7 minus square root 10 all over 2. Or 2x is 7 plus the square root of 10. So x is 7 plus the square root of 10 over two. So you might, you might not like those two answers, but those are the answers. And alternatively, if the square root thing is disturbing you, if you can't do those square root steps in your head, just do them on the paper and say, well, I'll just compute square roots of both sides. <coughs> square root 2x minus 7 all squared equals square root 10. And then recall, what is the square root of 2x minus 7 all squared? Absolute value, right? And then now have a look at this equation. What could I possibly reveal to make it true? <laughs> square root of 10 or negative square root of 10? Either way. <clears throat> Any question about these exercises? Now, last time, we did an exercise like this. I said, can you solve x squared plus 2x, <coughs> uh, x squared plus 10x, and then how about plus 16 equal to 0. Okay, so then how did we solve this last time? Oh, this one? Yeah, we can solve this one. Can you find two numbers whose product is 16 and whose sum is 10? Two and eight, right? So we could factor this as x plus 8 
multiplied by x plus 2 equal to 0. And so then, from this position, when you get comfortable with this, you can just read off the answer. What are the two answers to this? Negative 8, <coughs> negative 2. And that worked great. Now, what if I give you this one? x squared plus 10x, and then how about um, plus 15 is equal to 0. So look at how similar it is. <laughs> I mean, it really couldn't get any more similar, I think. But can you solve this one by factoring? I don't think so. I can't think of two numbers off the top of my head whose product is 15 and whose sum is 10. Ah, but, but now we need to solve it. So this is what we're going to do. Is I'm going to take... I'm going to take this equation and perform a sequence of algebraic operations and I'm going to turn it into an equation that looks like this kind. So it looks like this now, and I'm going to perform some operations, and it's going to look like that. And once you get it here, then you can take it from there. right? Because then you can say, oh, it splits into two possibilities, and blah, blah, blah. So if I can show you how to get from, from an equation that has this structure to an equation that has that structure, then you can make it the rest of the way. So that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to do for now, all I want you to do is just verify that everything I'm doing is, that there's nothing wrong with the, what I'm doing. But I'm not going to explain why I'm doing it until after the fact. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group together everything that has an X, because all of them are going to a party. 15 doesn't have an x, <coughs> so it's not going to the party. Okay, so now, inside of the square parentheses, we're going to add something. And what is the only thing that you can add inside of those parentheses that would not change the exercise? Zero. <coughs> Zero is the only thing you could put in there. But now, what we're going to do is we're going to be as clever as possible, and we're going to make that zero be as nicely shaped as possible. So specifically, we're going to add some amount and subtract the same amount. So for example, if, if it so happened that we added 12, we would also subtract 12. That'd be a way to write 0. So specifically what we're going to do is we're going to add something over 2 squared, and then we're going to subtract the same something over 2 squared. Now remember, I'm not telling you why we're doing this. I would just like for you to observe that what I'm doing is within the rules. So I haven't told you what the numerator is. I said something over 2. Okay. That something is this number. That's zero. It's a strange way to write zero. Now, what is 10 over 2? And then that squared is 25. So what I'm saying is for reasons that are as yet unclear, we're going to find it quite expedient to add 25 and then subtract 25. Now, the reason... <coughs> 
on the way to the reason we're going to do that is I'd like for you to observe something about these first three terms. These first three terms inside of the square parentheses can be factored in the best way possible. How do they factor? Five and five, right? Can you think of two numbers whose product is 25 and whose sum is 10? Five and five. So the first three become x plus five squared. So now we're going to collect all the constants together and deassociate and get to x plus 5 squared minus 10 is equal to 0. So that x plus 5 squared is equal to 10. And now I'd like to point out that I made good on my promise, right? I said that I was going to perform a sequence of algebraic operations to turn that into one of these. And that's what we just did. So you can take it from here. <coughs> so what would you do? Covering that up, what could I possibly reveal to make this true? square root of 10 or negative square root 10 <clears throat> either by radicals or directly so it must be the case that x plus 5 is negative square root 10 or x plus 5 is positive square root 10 and then we can solve these in the usual way so x is negative 5 minus the square root of 10 or <coughs> x is negative 5 plus the square root of 10 Oops. interesting so this horizontal this vertical space I left here is if you wanted to do radicals in between. Right, so then I'll write it in here just for those of you who like that. So to, to, to switch to radicals, you compute the square root of both sides. What's the square root of the left hand side? Absolute value of x minus 5, uh, x plus 5, and then the right hand side is square root 2. So depending on how you think about it, maybe you did this, maybe you didn't. Okay. Any question about this? So now a few comments. <coughs> so that I kind of pulled that out of the out of the ether, didn't I? <laughs> so this technique of turning an expression like this into an expression like that, this algebraic technique has a name. to get from there to there. That's, this is called complete the square. <clears throat> now, this 10 that we used in our exercise, it's always this number is always the numerator. So if this had been a 16, it had been 16 over 2. It is always over 2. The reason it is always over 2 is because, if you recall from the beginning of the semester, we looked at expressions that look like this, a plus b all squared, and then we foiled them out. And when you foil them out, you get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. That 2 is that 2 they're the same. 
So that's the reason why it's always 2 in the end, is because of this. <coughs> And finally, finally, what do these, notice on this exercise, on the easy one now, <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> we ask, can you think of two numbers whose product is 16 and whose sum is 10? Ah, 8 and 2. And then we asked ourselves, selves, can you think of two numbers whose product is 15 and whose sum is 10? And I think all of us said, not, not really. <laughs> I can't think. Of, I can't think of any such numbers. Well, these are those numbers. These are the ones that do it. In fact, the negation of these, which is to say, that you know, if we had a if we had a computer for a brain, then we could know that actually that factors as x minus the first one. multiplied by x minus the second one. Now this is not necessary for us today, but it will be necessary toward the end of the semester to be able to factor any such, right? So these two numbers are here, here and here. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Now let's do one of these exercises, but let's do it not with so much wiring diagram, and let's not do, show so many steps that you really wouldn't show in a, in a real exercise. So to be quick now, I could say, for example, please solve x squared plus 20x minus 13 is equal to 0. Now, if I gave you no instructions, then that would mean that you are free to use whatever technique you wish. So you should, you, you should at least first try the simplest possible technique. And what is that? Can you factor it? Can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 13 and whose sum is 20? Probably not off the top of your head. So then, that means that we're going to do the only other thing we know how, which is to complete the square. So we're going to separate out the x's, the things with x, from the things without. And then we're going to take half of that number, which is, and then we're going to square it, which is 100. And we're going to add that much and subtract the same. So x squared plus 20x plus 100 minus 100. Do you always have to put the addition first? Uh, the addition is the one that goes with. Okay, then these first three terms are a square. They can be factored as a square. What do they factor as? 10 and 10. Yeah. So x plus 10, all squared. And then minus 100. And so then x plus 10, all squared is 113. And the reason why we couldn't think of two numbers who, that did it is because in the end they involved the square root of 113. <laughs> That's why you couldn't do it in your head probably. So there's two possibilities. That x plus 10 is negative square root 113 or x plus 10 is positive square root of 113 which is to say x is negative 10 minus square root 113, or x is negative 10 plus square root of 113. Okay, <clears throat> so now, in the remaining time, I need to explain to you why it's called complete the square. I can remember back in the day, in grade school or whatever, when 
my teacher first taught me complete the square and she said the phrase dutif dutifully said the phrase this is completing the square and I waited for her to tell me what what that meant and she just never said it and I, I was just left hanging what square Who, and who's making all of these in incomplete squares apparently and what's that about okay so let's not leave y'all hanging. So <coughs> algebra students only do this procedure algebraically. So the algebraic procedure is this. So I'm going, I'm going to just write a b, which means any number there. And then I'm going to leave off the constant term, because remember, we were ignoring it anyway. So what, what you have to do is you do x squared plus bx and then we're going to add half of b squared and then subtract half of b squared so in the end that's the algebraic trick and then the idea is that well these first three terms can be written as a square themselves so those first three terms become x plus b over 2 squared. Those three become that one, and this one is itself. So sort of fundamentally, algebraically, what completing the square does is it turns an expression into the difference of squares. But that's not where it takes its name. It takes its name from the geometry of what's happening. Now, x squared plus bx has a common factor of x, so I could factor it out and write x times x plus b. And one thing that I want you to take away from this class is that where geometry is concerned, product relates to area which is to say, for example, this sheet is a rectangle. And suppose we got out our ruler and we measured that this was 3 and that 5. And what's the area of this sheet? 15, the product. Which is to say, here is a product, x times x plus b, so we're going to construe that as being a rectangle. I'll say that this is x, and this is x, and that's b, which is to say this side is x, and that side is x plus b. So now I'm going to take the b part, and I'm going to cut it in two, like this. In, in, in particular, I'm going to cut it in half. And I'm going to shade one of the sides so that you can watch how it moves. So there's one piece, I cut it, and now I shaded one of them. This is x, this is x. What is this measurement right here? b over 2, right? So we have a b over 2, and then what's the one right next to it? That one right there. Also b over 2, right? So now I'm going to take it and change its shape but not its area by taking this shaded one and moving it to the bottom. <clears throat> so you can see I moved the shaded bit to the bottom but I didn't change the area at all, so it's still an equation. Because mo moving shapes around doesn't change the area. But now that I have this picture drawn in this way, I'd like for you to observe, how long is that? How long is that measurement right there? X plus B over 2. And how long is that measurement right there, the whole thing there? Also X plus B over 2. 
So, it's almost a square, but it, someone took a bite out of it. So you might say that this square is incomplete. <laughs> oh, it's an incomplete square. Okay. Well, if we were to fix it, x, x, b over 2, b over 2. Well, I could fix it by just taking a little bit and drawing it right here, but I'd like for you to observe this, this height is b over 2 and that width is b over 2. So if I fill it in here with a little green shim, if I had to have taken that from somewhere, so I'll say minus that much over here. And then what is the area of this green piece? What's this piece? This is b over 2? This is b over 2 squared. And so remember, what, what is the algebraic understanding of completing the square? It's turning something into the difference of squares. And what's that? The difference of squares. I even drew the green parts in green for you in both places. Terrific. Okay, so we'll continue this on Wednesday. Have a nice day.